Hey, where's the intro? Yes. I am Ondo. I am your host. You gotta quit fucking around. As far as I'm concerned, that's a good thing. A way to sort of cause trouble. <laughs> Welcome to the Undergang Armchair. Bring it. Alright gang, welcome back to episode 33. I'm your host, Ando, and we got a great talk for you guys today. Our guest is Jacob Fabricius, director of Charlottenburg Art Hall. You guys can look forward to that in just a few minutes. And the first time we got to tell you about all this crazy shit going on. Okay, bad news first, right? Always bad news first. Website meltdown. Something's going on. We're either under attack or there's some sort of error in the, I don't know, in the hoonanny boot fangle. We are armchair web developers as well as armchair podcasters, and uh, we're trying to figure it out. We don't know how long it'll be down. We do actually think we are perhaps under attack from somewhere on the interwebs, maybe from outer space. We don't know. Regardless to say, our only site right now is Twitter. The good news is the episode will still be up. You can hear it on Stitcher Radio. You can hear it on iTunes. We'll be tweeting about that to keep you guys in the know. And if you are hearing this and you are on Twitter, please help us spread the word because we have no website. Well, hopefully by the time this is up, we will, but we don't know. That was the bad news. Good news. There's lots of it, which is great. We just got back from Israel. We had a great trip. It's a crazy, crazy place, a contradictory place. I won't say that much about it this time around. I will say more in the outro, but uh, it's worth a visit, although it's also extremely frustrating. In other good news, personally, I sold a picture today that is worth celebrating. Very nice. But even better, the cream on today's good news cake is we got a grant. The Danish Arts Foundation has decided to give us a small grant to help develop and expand this show, and uh, we couldn't be happier. We're really thankful to the listeners like you, the people who are just coming on board and the people who have been on board, and we're really thankful to the foundation for believing in what we're doing. We're going to use the money wisely. We got big plans. We're going to get some new equipment that's going to help this show sound better, going to get more people on the show. All is well. So, thank you. Like I say, today's guest is Jacob Fabricius. He was kind enough to meet with me, sit down and talk. Today's theme is the public and private divide. You know, the role of, of a director of a public institution in a time when, when funding is disappearing. Public funding is shrinking every year. And uh, we talked about it. And it's, it's interesting, the, the position you're put in as the leader of a public institution in order to make ends meet. I mean, you constantly have to make sure there are people coming in the door. You're serving a public. You're being held responsible for the amount of visitors you get. Yet at the same time, you're getting less and less money to put on shows, to have exhibitions, to have artists come. I mean, as Jacob points out in the talk, the price of shipping artwork is going up and up and up and up. You want to have an international arts program? You need money. That's it's all part of it. Jacob's been a bit of a mystery to me, so it was a pleasure to finally get to talk to him and kind of pick his brain. And he's also honestly a celebrated person in the Danish arts world. People were really, really excited when he got this position. He was for many years the director of the Malmö Kunsthall over in Sweden across the bridge here from Copenhagen, which is also a storied and venerable institution. But when he came back across to Denmark to uh, to run Charlottenborg, people were were rightly really excited. And he hasn't failed to deliver. There's been a bunch of great shows since he started. If you're a longtime listener of this show, you heard me raving and ranting for weeks on end about the Superflex show they had. There's a great show up right now, Camille Henra. It's another French name I don't really know if I'm saying correct. Camille Henra. Henra. Either way, it's a fantastic show. And I think what I really got out of this talk with him was clearly the man loves what he does. His passion and engagement with the art is what drives him, and that is, you know, clearly visible in the result. He also just got back from Senegal. He was at the Dakar Biennial, which is, of course, very interesting. I also asked him about that. We even got to talk a little bit about malaria pills. 
All right, that's enough. Let's talk to Jacob. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a matter of time and having the space to do it in, too. Yeah. Um, I wish I had... At some point, I thought I would, like, really get into um, sort of, like, um, iPod and, like, the like recordings and listening to programs right podcasts afterwards. yeah that's what this is yeah um, and it's a fantastic format but because of my job I'm able to listen to you know six hours a day or something yeah so I absorb huge amounts of it and that's why I started this because I thought hey I like to talk to people yeah, yeah. you know I can do this yeah yeah um, so I mean it's, it's a great format yeah I actually just forgot I have to take my malaria pill Oh, are you, uh, right, you had to do that beforehand. Yeah, that's the boss. Uh-uh. So, I was like, uh, I was, I was like, on my, I think, third day there, I was like, I was talking to someone, and they said, oh, so, so what are, what, uh, what are your malaria pills like? Like, malaria? <laughs> right. But no side effects? No, not so far, but I, I, I this was something that I bought in a, like a almost 24 hour pharmacy there and of course they didn't speak English and my French is very bad and their French was quite bad <laughs> so, so it was like really a difficult first she thought that I had already gotten malaria uh. Uh, and then um, then we sort of like then she understood that no it was to prevent me from getting malaria so I have no idea what I'm eating and also all the inscriptions are in French and my French is bad so uh, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But how was it? I mean, Senegal is not the most common place to go to see art, I would say. No, I was, I was really curious uh, about Senegal. Uh, I'd heard uh, things about the Biennial for many years and I'd never been. Uh, and I thought it was exciting to go to this great continent uh, where uh, there's not so many artists that, that sort of like come to to do like large exhibitions in 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 europe yeah uh, so i thought that was like my challenge to come and see and understand um the the works and their origin and stuff like that and um and that's that's kind of why i went um and um i did one exhibition at malmo Kunsthalle with uh with Pascal Martin Tayou, he lives in Belgium, of course, but he's originally from Cameroon. So I was thinking, oh, this this is research for the future. Uh, and they had a very strong uh, they, that their topic was uh, gender and uh, sexuality and homosexuality. And I just thought, like, that's quite radical to even discuss that in in Africa. Yeah. Um, Especially considering the things that are happening now with making it illegal and yeah. you know persecution etc yeah so so that was that was what triggered this this travel I, I was just like how can you come about that like when you have such a strong religious uh, presence both Christianity and, and, and Islam mm. uh, and then like taking this subject out in the open uh, it's downright know. dangerous in a way isn't yeah. it yeah uh, and it wasn't the, the I would say it wasn't it wasn't very strong in the main exhibition, mm. um, and yeah. So so that was that was a little bit disappointing, but but then there was a space which is one of the off spaces. Um, there are like two hundred or two hundred fifty off spaces. Wow! Where the spaces they uh, apply, uh, and then there's a committee that selects them and say you can be an off space. Is this like artist-run spaces, that sort of thing? It can be galleries. It can be off uh, artist-run spaces, and, and then they get in the program uh, as an off space in the biennial. And then you like when you you go far away in a taxi, and then all of a sudden you're in a, like a ceramics workshop, or you go to a private gallery and stuff like that. But all are kind of part of the, 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 the program. That's fascinating. So Raw uh, Material uh, Company is, is one of these spaces, and it's one of the spaces that is um, kind of like, it's run on a private initiative, a curator. So she has put money in, uh, and then also some different foundations they have put money in. So there is somewhat of an infrastructure. 
Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah, in some sense. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot of spaces like that in Africa, actually. Right. I mean, I shouldn't be surprised because, of course, Africa to most Europeans is a myth. I've never been there. I, I imagine it's a lot more civilized than what you hear about in the newspapers, you know. Yeah. Pretty much constantly gets negative press. Yeah. But, you know, people live there and go about their daily lives. So yeah. why not? Why wouldn't there be art and, you know, yeah. uh, foundations for art world? Yeah. Um, but it must be a different set of challenges. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and Raw, they, they actually did a show that dealt with gender and dealt with homosexuality. And in my perspective, it was a very soft show. Um, it was not uh, like the wildest thing was like maybe uh, so sort of like a half naked man putting on lipstick right that's not so radical for me in, right. uh, from my perspective of like how you deal with gender or sexuality um, but that created such a fuss it was like they had all the, the lamps outside the building were smashed and like a group of, I think, four or five or six ran into the building because they thought they could trash it or something like that. Right. So the, they have constantly, they have a residence, Western residencies. Um, so they have a residency program that's like an English artist, uh, an American um, uh, researcher and a writer from Mali, I think. Yeah. And they actually had to take them out of their residencies, out of their apartments and relocate them in hotels because it was too dangerous they were afraid that that something could happen right it was on the news uh, all the time uh, while i was there and um i'll just try and find a picture but it was just like i was waiting for an artist for a, at a studio visit and then the news was on and i was just watching the news and it was just like really uh really ridiculous well that's why it's tame you know just the fact that to us a picture of a man putting on, on lipstick is not very, um, you know, doesn't really cross any lines. But if they'd done more, you know, the place could have been burned down. Yeah, totally. No, these, I, I, of course, I couldn't understand what they were saying, but but uh, I got a little bit of a translation, and it was the, the classical thing about, like, what will happen in the afterlife, and like how these uh, transgender, homosexual uh girls and boys uh, how they would be prosecuted and burned in hell and stuff like that and that was on the news yeah there was like let me show you there was, this was the um, so this is like they're discussing homosexuality in Senegal right but then if you look in the back there's like this uh, is the statue of David or I actually Pastor? don't know if it's the statue of David but it's basically a Greek sculpture uh, so an ancient sculpture and the penis is blacked out. Right, censored. It's got a bar over it. Yeah. So, so this was kind of like it was just so absurd, and uh, I wish I could have understood. But then again, I kind of got the, the the picture of like how what what the level of discussion was. Right. So that's also that that also was kind of a interesting in in um, in just attempting to touch base or touch the subject in Africa. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah. So, how, how does that relate? I mean, how does that make you feel when you return here to the safe haven, in a way, you know, where you're you're directing an art hall here in town? Did this affect you in any way? Did it did it change the way you saw your role? Um, not not really. Not in the sense that, um, um, like, no, like uh, I wouldn't change like the artist what they want to show and right. like that. Uh, but I mean you're obviously interested in bringing some of this into you know it's a networking situation it's yeah. you know I'm assuming you're looking abroad to bring people in and to make shows and yeah no, there's like uh, I, I, I did visit some, some artists and they actually touched on the subject and uh, some did some really fantastic work um, and um it's it's basically the, the sort of like the rel religious tribe or the religious uh, sort of like group of of um, Senegalese or Africans that are, that that have a problem with just discussing sexuality. Right. Um, but of course, the, the the artists are, I think, much more open in some sense. Right. Anyway, so this after I came home, this was actually what happened here in Charlottenburg. 
Oh, I saw that. You were you tweeting. That? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, that would be a lot of trouble. So this is a picture. This is a, a Fluxus concert where people were playing music and getting naked and then looks like running around the piano. Yeah. Was that and part so of distortion? That was part of distortion. <laughs> and it was like they were simulating uh, uh, an intercourse. And I sent this to uh, one of the production managers at the Raw company. And I said, uh, this is just what happened in Copenhagen now two days after I came home right. and they were like what <laughs> what is that <laughs> yeah it's interesting those two the, the way that you know an art hall relates so much to the place it's in and that's of course its role is to represent what's going on you know where it is both internationally and where it is the locality yep um, <clears throat> I do want to go back a little bit uh, where in Denmark do you did you grow up uh, I grew up in uh, Silkeborg, which is kind of like the Lake District uh, Beautiful area. area. Yeah. yeah. Did you uh, were your parents artists or anything? I mean, how did you no, get interested? No, they're school teachers, uh, primary school teachers, uh, now retired. But um, but my father uh, did a lot of sort of like um, work uh, in Europe, mm. uh, Iceland, England, Germany. Um, so we were actually traveling a lot because it was, I think, it's just easier for him when he was working outside of Denmark, um, teaching other teachers English and doing all these sort of like um, uh, connecting Europe kind of like teaching mm. groups. Um, it was just easier for him to bring the family. So we travel with them a lot and uh, they both have a, like an interest in sort of museum and art and uh, sort of antiques and stuff like that. Um, so we went to a lot of museums. We would drag through like all the museums in Europe. Did you uh, hate it in the beginning? Uh, I was more into sort of like actually going to the. Um, I liked it, but but I, I think I was more into sort of like the the Second World War museums in mm. in, uh, in Germany and Holland and and, and stuff like that. Um, that makes sense. It's. Uh, I don't know. As a as a kid, that that fascinated me a lot. It's more of a dramatic narrative arc. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, where did you start getting kind of more seriously involved? I mean, I did a little bit of research before coming here. I noticed you had, or still do, have a press. Yeah. Um, From 97. Yeah. Uh, Is that still running? It's still running, but at a very low pace. Right. Um, if I do a one publication a year, I'm, I'm quite happy about it. Some some books are small some are photocopied, some are like records and mm. vinyls. Um, it sort of depends. Pork salad press. Yeah. Uh, great name, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, but, I mean, wh where did it become a career choice for you? At what point did you start really, really engaging on that level? Um, I think basically uh, because I studied art history and um, I thought... Uh, I thought there was too little contemporary art in in the courses that were at the time possible to to actually um, join at the university, um, and then I, by chance, I had a fantastic teacher there, and and I don't know why, but nobody applied for these Erasmus grants to travel to travel, yeah, and, and then um, Hanne Marie Raun Jensen, she uh, she. For some reason, not because I was a good student at all, but, but somehow she liked me and she said, like, why, why don't you apply for this? And then I got a, a scholarship or like a, an Erasmus exchange to uh, University of Sussex in England. Mm. And they had a much more advanced uh, contemporary program dealt with modern culture and dealt with like just the independent group from the 50s in England with Richard Hamilton and so on. Um, so I spent half a year there and... Did that kind of blow open the doors for you? I mean, it kind of <laughs> looked at a different way to engage with art history. Yeah, totally. It 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 um, it changed at least my path because, like, while I was studying, I was visiting all the young galleries. At the time, there was like quite a few younger spaces. There was uh, um, Sega Basement, uh, Nikolai Velna. Uh, there was Nerfa Maxke. There's all these small artist front spaces. That this is in the 90s, right? Yeah, this is 90, 93, yeah, yeah. 94. Right, that's right, when Nikolai Belner yeah. opened. So I kind of like, uh, I, I kind of followed that scene and uh, was just a, you know, a spectator, but, but it fascinated me. Um, and then I was writing a few articles for, uh, for artists at the time. Um, <clears throat> and then... 
I was there's some others that fascinate me more than others, of course. Mm. Uh, uh, but um, while I was in Brighton, I I started also to do some research on the English scene and sort of like the sort of up and coming sort of YBA um, right. artists. Um, and I met some of them. I did some interviews and stuff like that. And, uh, and then slowly I got into this more uh, curatorial practice um, and with Frederica Hansen um, we took over Campbell's occasionally and started uh, doing exhibitions uh, in this uh, storefront um, in where was that? Goddersgade okay <clears throat> in um, Goddersgade in Copenhagen in 95 I think mm. um, so that was kind of like and then I did my uh, sort of like uh, uh, independent projects from 97. Is that what became Appendix? No. Appendix uh, was, um, that was with uh, two artists, uh, Elisabeth Johnson and Pierre Ronneke. Mm. Uh, and that was from discussions about opening a, a book space and, um, uh, or space for books and exhibitions. Uh, a more sort of like a discourse around theory and art and right. sort of like everything in between. Um, so that was a few years later. That was maybe 2002. So you were basically always on your own creating creating venues to work in. Yep. You didn't have, did you work for a gallery at some point or do any of that kind of traditional... Uh, I did. I did uh, help out uh, Nikolai Valner in uh, sort of the like late nineties, mm. but at the same time I was running these two project spaces. So we were sharing office, and then I was running a space called Recent Works and a space called Video Drone. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, but it, yeah. Um, uh, and then I got a lot of. Um, I wouldn't say it was a traditional kind of work setting because I wasn't paid like a regular pay or anything like that. But I went to art fairs uh, with the gallery and stuff like that, and, mm. and got a, like a lot of international connections through that 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 time. Right. Um, but basically, um, it was just doing my own kind of projects and doing these project spaces that I learned a lot. So it's always been learning by doing it. I've, I've never been to these curatorial courses or, s- or schools or whatever. Right. Um, it seems like to me, I've been, you know, I, like I said, I've been doing some research on what you do. You, you seem to be very interested in, I don't know what word to use, cutting edge, uh, the most contemporary of contemporary art, you know, you're kind of interested in taking a bite of the boundary and presenting it. You know, I was looking over the exhibition program for Appendix, and although I wasn't in Denmark at that time, my guess is that was pretty out there for what was considered a exhibition worthy material. Yeah, yeah, it was just, it was small projects, it was small events and stuff like that, but but um, I think it created like a small community. But yeah. what, I mean, what is it that attra- I mean, you're obviously attracted to to curating or or you know engaging with with work which isn't necessarily commercially viable. Um, you know, making 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 this accessible to a public which wouldn't otherwise see it. If you hadn't made mm-hmm. appendix, I imagine a lot of that work wouldn't have been shown, or at least had a hard time getting shown. Uh, so I'm, what, I'm, what I'm looking for is kind of like why? What is it about that work that Interests you? Uh, well, it's the the discourse that the the, the work uh, creates. Um, uh, all the social political contents of, of these works that that uh, I feel is important to um, mediate or um, uh, get out there uh, in different contexts. I like I've really been interested in um, a lot of public projects. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, meeting the public in other spaces than the regular white cube gallery space, uh, institutional space, um, I think is is quite challenging. Um, That's the thing. Yeah, um, and um, it's just for me, it's, it's just been uh, interesting to find, you could say, look at different vehicles uh, for um, mediating contemporary art uh, and try to either um, put fuel in vehicles that already exist or 
um, taking advantage of what the fuel was already there and then sort of like try and making get, a new vehicle yeah <laughs> yeah you could say that or cut out the vehicle right or, right um, uh, but but basically yeah that's um, uh, that is that's that I have done a lot uh, until I started uh, my institutional uh, career you could say uh, well, I think you do bring it into your institutional career. I mean, here you are just coming back from Senegal. Yeah. Uh, which is, again, you're looking at the fringes of what's going on in the artwork, in yeah. the art world, you know. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the reasons that everyone was so happy when you came to Charlottenburg, because you brought with you uh, some sort of curiosity about the art world, which was... I feel lacking in a way. I mean, I'm definitely an outsider, so I don't know that much about the history of this institution, which is a very historical, classic Danish yeah. art hall. I don't know, was it the first or? Uh, yeah. It, 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 it's really a storied and, and, you know, even just the building, it's such a classical yeah. place. Yeah. Um, but I mean, obviously you are engaging, you're, you're, you're out there searching, you're not letting it come to you. No, no, no. Uh, it was that, I mean, it's just interesting to me, this public-private divide and how you make these things public. Because you work in an institution which does not have commercial... You don't have to sell work. You do have to make sure people come, and you are beholden to that. Yep. Uh, I assume it's tax money driven. Yep. yep. Uh, so, you know, you are you, you are responsible to someone, but your goal, your, your job here is to uh, be part of the art world. Mm -hmm. Be part of showing work. Um, and hopefully present works that uh, are not presented on the map, on the Danish scene or the region elsewhere, to try and uh, tap into uh, what an interesting artist. There's like so many artists internationally that are fantastic and have never shown in, in, in Denmark. Um, so I think it's of course interesting to bring uh, bring in those people. Uh, Absolutely. And try and combine it with the local scene and with the local history and stuff like that. Is it? Do you feel like the Danish art world is changing? I mean, do you feel like it's more open to what you do? Um, not, not necessarily. No. Uh, open in, yeah. Well, I mean, here, here, let me put it this way: from my outsider perspective, I've been in Denmark for eight years. Uh -huh. In these eight years. I've seen the end, the tail end of the all, all the young galleries and the new money, uh, 2007 ish. There was all those yeah. galleries, a lot of money. No one was trying anything interesting, but it was you know people were getting into buying art. The Danish public. Then there was the so-called collapse. A lot of galleries closed, consolidated. Blah 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 blah. And then now what I'm seeing is the creation of Chart, uh, the new contemporary art festival or uh, fair. Um, the fact that there's a boom in artist-driven spaces. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I think I feel like it's there's so really amazing. a lot of a lot of like from just people taking their own initiative. Yeah. To to make uh, art spaces which aren't commercial necessarily. And that actually reminds me of the '90s, like like the the, the where there was no commercial structure. There was basically no the very few galleries um, that dealt with other mediums than traditional painting sculpture mm. kind of thing um, very few um, and then there was the boom of, of, of uh, 2000 zeros where like a lot of commercial galleries they popped up like presenting all new medias and right, street yeah. art and, yeah yeah you know, that sort of thing um, and now again it's it seems like the 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 artists run spaces are coming back like mm. and there's so many of them and they're doing interesting stuff uh, so that I find such a such a positive thing for the Copenhagen scene right that's where I feel like maybe things are changing a little <clears throat> bit totally um, what happened but you went you worked as the director of the Malmö Kunsthal mm -hmm. across the water here yep um was that your first institutionalized job to that level? I mean, you worked for Nikolai Valner a little bit, but was this the first real kind of... Yeah, it was my first uh, steady job where I got a monthly pay. Right. Um, 
prior to that, I had worked at a space called Centre d'Art Santa Monica in uh, in Barcelona. Mm. But that was only like a thirty percent uh, job, right? Say. So I, at the same time, I was r- running this uh, KPH Kunsthal in uh, by Steno Apotheek, uh, the pharmacy uh, across. Uh, oh, by the train station. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like a, a, a you know a, a public project that I was running. Uh, and at the same time, I was doing exhibitions in in, um, in Barcelona. Mm. So that was my first kind of like uh, work where um, where I had the responsibility of doing uh, exhibitions um, with contemporary international artists. So um, every three months, I would do one or two shows. Um, Frances Ruiz, uh, Mike Nelson, Seal Floyer, uh, Dave Halfish Bailey, um, or just some other. Um, and, but I didn't stay in Barcelona. I went for like a week or three weeks to help the artists install. Mm-hmm. So my first, and at the same time, I was actually the former director at Malmö Kunsthal. Um, Lars Granby, he, uh, he had seen one of my last projects at Appendix uh, with Susan Phillips. Uh, and I produced a, a CD with Susan Phillips uh, with uh, her singing Siggy Stardust a cappella. Uh, that sounds excellent. It was, it was beautiful. <laughs> it's a beautiful record. Um, and he liked it and he invited uh, Susan to do a solo show at Malmö Kunsthal uh, like a few months later. Uh, and then he basically asked me as a curator, do you want to be the curator of this? Take it from A and all the way to the end. And uh, bam, there you are. Yeah. So so oh. that's, that's while I was doing other uh, curatorial projects in Denmark and elsewhere, I did four exhibitions in, uh, in Malmö. And during the last one, for different reasons, uh, they invited me. Um, uh, either I knew the artist before uh, I had worked with Elmgren Darkset uh, several many years ago like from, from the mid 90s the Danish Norwegian art duo yeah, yeah. Uh, and also like uh, at Campbell's I actually uh, showed um, David Strickley mm. uh, so it was easy for them to invite a curator in who already knew the artist and could, could basically do the whole exhibition, produce right. the whole exhibition. So that's what I did. And during that process of the David Strigley exhibition, um, uh, Lars, he left uh, his directorship and um, the staff asked me, do you want to apply? And I applied and I went through the three interviews or something like that and um, and got the job. So that was my first sort of like regular income uh, director job. Right. Now, if I were you, I would have been terrified I mean, just that fact that all of a sudden you are the head of, of an institution of that size. Yeah. Or did you just feel excited? Like, now, finally, I have a platform to work with. No, I, I, of, course, uh, of course, I was also... Uh, it's a beautiful space. It's, like, uh, it's so incredible, and the mm-hmm. staff is really nice. Uh, so I felt, in, uh, I felt uh, really comfortable there. And I knew the people already, so there was no surprises cost some surprises but but not 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 many um, but I actually I was asked by the cultural director at the time who who formerly was the one employing me together with the politicians um, he asked me uh, about contract and he offered me a three year contract or a four year contract mm. and I actually said that I would prefer the three year contract um, I wanted to see how it was being a director, running a space, and um, and test it right. both for me, but for the also for the staff and for the space. Like, how would that match? Right. How, what, what would it be like? There was a lot of learning involved too. You had no. I mean, you had created spaces and been director of them, but walking into a, a, an existing institution, there must be a lot to yeah. learn in how yeah. to do it. And there's a difference between two cubic meters and, and two thousand, <laughs> right? Uh, and that was that was the case from uh, KBH Kunsthalle, which was this public space, two cubic meters, and, and Malmo is two thousand square meters. So, right. 
So of course, there's a, like a, a big responsibility on budget and like uh, getting people in and all this staff, yeah, and staff and all this. So, uh, so that was definitely a challenge. Um, but I, I was never worried about it, really. Um, I had to get used to it. Right. I was still getting used to institutional life because right. there's still so much of a like a, a freelancer in me. Um, where I get involved in, in many of the process in, in the exhibition making. Right. So there's still th- things that I need to let go. Kind of. Right. <clears throat> but um, Do you want to control every step along the way? No, 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 no. No, no, not at all. But but uh, just because for so many years I was used to doing everything myself. Right. Um, and that took a, a, some time in Malibu to get used to thinking, oh, there's a press person there, there's a technician there. Right. I can ask them to do it. It's fantastic that they're so professional and they just do it. Right. Uh, so that's kind of like... Well, those are the advantages. You can yeah. you can undertake much larger scale projects yeah. uh, logistically and you know conceptually as well. Yeah. And that's what we did. We did we produced like a lot of really great and really large scale exhibitions in, in Malmö. Um, a great, great team. Uh, enthusiastic and also the artists they were like met with just uh, very open Mm. mindedness Mm. Um, and I was there like uh, for a little bit more than five years so addition to the two years where I've just been freelancing with four exhibitions I was director there for like a little bit more than five years Mm. and I um, when the Shalonbo job came up uh, I was I was just thinking it this it's just it's just so weird that this space can't get a public or it can't run uh, properly. Right. I mean we don't have to dwell on it, but you were overtaking the helm when things were kind of in shambles. They had one of the worst years ever in terms of visitors. There were some issues with the director, you know, it, it was it needed a savior. Is what they were looking for. Uh, actually, I don't think uh, Mark Slayton was in such bad trouble. Uh, he was, I think he was doing a great exhibitions, uh, interesting program. Mm. Uh, but it's just, as you may know, like as a as a uh, foreigner in Denmark, it's not always easy. No. Uh, and uh, then if you are trying to turn around audience numbers, bad press, with without that specific network of Danishness, right? Uh, then you can kind of be uh, met rather harsh, yeah. um, and then uh, basically the press they kept going on uh, the, 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 um, the the bad numbers of for, for attendance and stuff like that. And mm. So in that respect, there, yeah, there's something needed to be done, um, uh, and. Um, but I, I, I thought that was a, like, a great challenge uh, in some sense. Um, it's still difficult. Uh, we have taken it and turned it around. Uh, we've doubled the amount of, um, of audience uh, in a one year. So mm. now we are like around 55,000. That's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, and to make that steady, of course, there's still a long way. But, but um, it's, a, it's a good start. Uh, especially when you consider the money aspects like we have such a small budget right if you compare that to the amount of square meters that we have the amount of exhibitions that we have to produce to keep having an audience uh, that doesn't match right it, it's like uh, all of a sudden two and two becomes six right or, uh, you have to make magic, literally. It's it's difficult. It's just difficult because we have very very we're short on staff and short on money, mm-hmm. um, and we still have to create and make a success um, with exhibitions, with audience, and la la. So right. it's 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 not it's definitely not easy. <laughs> it's not a it's not a if a, if I had if I had chosen the 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 the, the easy life, I would have taken three more years in Malmo. <laughs> right. And they, they offered that to me, so I was like... Uh, right. But um, but the challenge, you do enjoy the challenge. Yeah, totally. I think that's that's great. 
I, uh, I was just talking, like I said, with, with Francesca, another guest on the show, and we were talking a lot about the, like, the changing nature of funding in Denmark, about how it is leaning towards a more liberal, uh, privately funded philanthropic model. Is that any option here? I mean, are you able to raise funds outside of, of the public money? We have to. Okay. We have to. That's uh, simply that's the way yeah. that you make it happen. Yeah, we we um, and we have to do it more and more actually right. uh, because the the I don't think the uh, the cultural budget doesn't get bigger. Uh, it gets smaller. Quite and, the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 it's there's not a lot of votes in in culture. Right. Uh, there should be, I think, actually, uh, but there are more votes in in hospitals and schools and stuff like that. Um, and that's totally fine with me. But 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 sometimes I think politicians they underestimate the value of culture and value of what the Danish art community is actually producing of value that can't be counted in dollars or right. euros or right. kroners. Um, and what that um, what musicians or um, Uh, artists when they are out in the world like doing their film and and people associate some positive experience in a show or in a concert or whatever with Denmark right Uh, that's uh, that's that's underestimated well I mean if you think about it Denmark has done a really good job of promoting itself for a country of this size it It, it, it's it's doing a pretty good job of promoting it culturally yeah, yeah. itself, um, <clears throat> but it's not doing a good job of bringing culture in. It's only going outwards, you know. So mm-hmm. your job would be to bring it in, right, and and present it and be part of some sort of international discourse in the art world, and that is where they don't really want seem to be interested in in that two way road with culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also just <clears throat> just the uh, uh, um, things are not getting cheaper uh, to uh, to transport, to insure, to build, right? Um, and that puts a strain on everything right. uh, on the budgets. Um, so you kind of like have to really tweak all the small things to 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 make exhibitions happen. Uh, I think. Um, Do you feel like it's a shame that you have to raise money outside from private? No, not not necessarily. I think that's that's fun. Like we did with, um, we started a collaboration with this uh, shopping chain called Tia. Yeah. Uh, and um, that was uh, um, during the the, the Superflex exhibition, right. where we actually, I thought we had a meeting with the 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 founder of Tia. Um, Regarding souvenirs, because we talked about a souvenir shop for super for the Superflex show, yeah. uh, and then in our discussions with uh, Lennart um, from Tia, um, he mentioned something about how they were producing records uh, with jazz musicians, like producing quality products with uh, with artists, musicians, uh, and instead of selling them for like 150, they would sell them for 30. Mm. Uh, and that just uh, that rang some sort of bell in my head and I went back a week later and said wouldn't it be interesting to actually produce a dry conceptual catalog with Superflex and put it out next to spices and hairbrushes and everything in the Tia shop Uh, that's like 68 or 70 in Denmark Uh, and instead of having a conceptual book Placed on a shelf in those two, three, four uh, bookstores that are dealing with right. this sort of publications, I thought it would be much more fun to get it to to Holstebro and to Espia and to Copenhagen, of course, and blah blah blah, in a totally different context. To to make a reach out to people who may not be necessarily uh, challenged by contemporary art and right. conceptual art. So so that that, that actually um, Leonard is very cool in that way that he kind of like he said that sounds like fun that sounds like a great project yeah. let's do that 
It's perfect for Superflex too. Yeah, it was perfect for Superflex. Of course, it, it dealt with the, their whole um, idea of economy and challenging economy and challenging systems and stuff like that. So, yeah. so in that respect, it was perfectly um, orchestrated. I think. Um, I don't know if if that if it had been another artist and it had been the starting point of her relationship with with Tia. Um, it may not have gone so well right. um, but now we're actually in the second production with them with uh, Flemming Christ Müller who is this um, we have this uh, 12 month project with um, uh, a poster project right. where there's three posters every month um, so now we're doing a, a book with them again and we'll see but like how what, what happens but, but it's it's kind of fun to try and think out of the the, the regular system uh, and and try to challenge the system and produce differently. Uh, right, and that's kind of going to be necessary if things keep changing the way they do. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think, I think, you know, back to the public-private thing, Denmark has relied so long on public money for the arts. It was baffling to me when I got here just to learn how to how to apply for money from the state, you know, because in America that doesn't really exist no. unless you're already really, really well known. So this whole, like, and, and, and people expect it too. They actually yeah. expect, you know, I, I meet artists all the time who have applied for money and are pretty, they think they're going to get it. Yeah. And that's, that's the beauty. In some sense it's the beauty. Uh, you know, uh, I, I definitely feel uh, lucky uh, that, uh, in the 90s, when I was like uh, in my late 20s, um, uh, I could apply for money. I could apply for, like, say, I have a project, I think it's a great idea. And um, if, if, if um, let's say, um, some of the, the first projects I did, I, I didn't, I don't come from a wealthy background. My parents are school teachers, just like, uh, uh, so that's middle income class and, um, uh, applying for money and actually getting the money basically started my whole way of curating. Right. It's uh, fantastic in a yeah. lot of ways. There's limitations yeah. to the system. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, but it's, it, it's, uh, it's a changing model. Yeah. And it has, it certainly, certainly has its limitations uh, in terms of the fact that it has to be kind of horizontal. It leaves out a certain type of project, you could say, and that's what's changing: is that the, the 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 private funding has to come in as the as the public disappears. Yeah, <clears throat> and, and yeah I think it's uh, I think it's fun and it's actually challenging to think about think about partners uh, who likes to play basically. Yeah, uh, who's interested, uh, generally uh, interested in art and culture, producing cutting edge exhibitions, showing artists that may not be shown, doing public exhibitions that may not otherwise have been shown. Right, for the love of it, essentially. For the love of it, and for to, to actually uh, give something back to the community, giving back something to the audience. Um, I think that's that's great. And I, uh, I'm in the search of like those partners, of course, uh, all the time. Um, and I would rather... <clears throat> I'd rather... Uh, Say work with uh, with uh, like a uh, like uh, Leonard from from Tia uh, because he thinks it's fun. He, right. he wants to challenge as well. Right. Uh, it's and that somehow makes more sense to me that uh, you know you're in a playground, you're dealing with like all these topics, serious political, social issues, uh, aesthetical issues, uh, and then if you can make it happen with somebody who actually wants to engage. That's perfect. That's ideal. Um, we, I don't think we can live without the public money because the public money is kind of like a, a really good base for us. Right. Um, but to make to top it up, to give it that extra, uh, and to actually be able to realize all the projects that we want to realize and make an extra level of engagement. Yeah, and then and, and, and keep and, it fun. You know, yeah. that's what it sounds like. The thing with Tia Tiger, uh, it sounds like that you guys are having a lot of fun. 
you know, and that's something which I think so is fun. forgotten yeah. Yeah, yeah. with 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 a, a, an art hall with any sort of like rarefied, stratified level in the art world. Fun often dies. You know, it becomes so serious and so important, quote unquote, that that the the play goes out of it. Yeah, uh, and that's why uh, you know. I think it's great, for example, the Post series you did where artists mailed in exhibitions. Uh -huh. That's very playful. That, that brings some level of fun and experimentation back to this sort of institution. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it's kind of like trying out the different formats uh, of exhibition making, uh, trying to challenge that, I think is, is really inspiring. Uh, and also, I, I'm really keen on um, working in as I said, in public space. So I also think it's important that we have an institution in there. It's made out of bricks. There are white walls. That's great. Mm -hmm. Let's show a lot of great works in there. But I think it would be really fun to do projects in um, in Newham, in the boats in Newham, in the harbor, right in next the door. harbor, or like anywhere. So like in the public space. So I'm like for like a year, I've been thinking about doing different projects. Uh, I still haven't found the right model to do it, but. But I really want to. I yeah. Think, I Again, think. breaking down the public-private divide. Yeah. yeah. It's great. Do you feel... I mean, I've had a couple of artists tell me that Malmö in general, the city of Malmö, which is in Sweden, across the bay, for people who don't know, or across the canal, um, has a more experimental nature to their, to their art world. They are a little more open to trying new things than Copenhagen. Do you think that's true? I mean, can uh, you feel a difference as being a director in Copenhagen and being a director in Malmö of an art space? Um, well, the institutional choices, uh, the artists that are shown, um, also it always depends upon the, the curator and the director, uh, like um, the program that's made. So well, and the public to and a the public and the public. Um, Historically, you could say that, that there's been Malmö Kunsthall and Roseum, the former Moderna Museum is in a building that was called Roseum uh, before in the 90s. Mm. Uh, and <clears throat> they did uh, really incredible exhibitions uh, and very experimental. So in some sense, um, Malmö has definitely had, uh, I think, uh, uh, over the last... 30 years, they've had a, a stronger profile of experimentation in, mm. than institutions in Copenhagen. But again, it's not a capital city either. There's a no. different dynamic being in the center yeah. of the capital of a country. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, do you see your role as being different between the two institutions? Are you just still going on the same, the same plan that you've been working on kind of throughout your life, throughout your career? I'm totally aware of um, how you have to uh, in some sense, it's a stupid word, but educate more here. Um, like, uh, for instance, in at Malmö Kunsthall, you would have uh, at every press meeting, you knew that you would have x amount of journalists that would make a reportage, a review, la la la. Uh, and when we have maybe one journalist here in Denmark, we would have had five in. Uh, right in Sweden so at least for every press meeting we would have maybe um, 15 and here we have 3 or 5 why is that do you think I, I am actually not sure maybe um, uh, maybe if the, the journalists are different in Denmark maybe they don't get as much editorial space of course um, maybe it's the um, the local newspapers in yeah. in, in, um, in Malmö that got more... Do you think that reflects the public somehow, or is that more just the media it's reflecting? I think it's definitely the media, uh, because uh, the, the, um, I've always been impressed by how, um, how Swedish television and radio have insisted on doing quite dry well-researched programs on bands or artists mm. and not to like pro pro program it to like 11 o'clock at night but 8 o'clock Friday night where your general public will probably see it or there's yeah. a better chance of it 
and in in Denmark we have game shows, right? Of course, uh, Ooh, America. Sorry yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, it's uh, so 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 Sweden. They have, they've actually done um, uh, a lot for these cultural programs, right. and and just to tr- generate interest to make people accept and be aware of contemporary waves or co- contemporary art. Uh, the press, the TV, uh, the written press is so important. Yeah, I think. Uh, right, I mean, because people, you know, if, if you get a review in the newspaper for your show, you'll get a lot more people coming. I talk to yeah. artists all the time. It's really important to try to get someone to write about it. Yeah, because people otherwise will not hear about it. They will yeah. not even know it existed. Yeah, which is kind of sad, but yeah. also just kind of the changing reality of things. Yeah. All right, so. you have to go, sir. Do I? Yeah, yeah. pretty soon. But uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show, and I think you're doing absolutely fantastic work. Thank you very much. All right, that was my hour with Jacob. I think it's a really interesting talk. I really want to thank him for taking the time to sit down and speak with me. And I think it's a really good reflection of where this show is going. We're trying to expand, you know, and I think it's also important to talk to... I don't want to call it the gatekeepers, but the people who make decisions about what art is shown where... And uh, and whose job is to bring you art to see, which you maybe don't have time or would not know about. So if you haven't been back at Charlottenburg for a while, I think the uh, the time is ripe to go check it out again. It's a fantastic space. If you're a visitor to Copenhagen and have never been here, it's also worth stopping by. And they're going to be hosting the Chart Art Fair, the second annual Chart Art Fair, this fall, which is also going to be exciting. It's a great space for that, too. And I think visiting is really, you know, if you want to help out the fact that there's less and less money coming in from the public coffers to places like Charlottenburg, then go pay your entrance and show up because they count who come. And the more people who come, the more important that place seems. Go for the shows, stay for the art, and enjoy high-quality international exhibitions right here in our backyard. It's a great space. I don't really know what to say about Israel. It's a situation, that country. Um, There was a lot of great things about it. There's a lot of things which are, um, how to put it delicately, which seem unjust. Uh, there's There's a lot of tension in a lot of ways. You got Tel Aviv on one hand, which is more of the beach town trying to relax and have a good time and, you know... It seemed a little bit like they were just trying to ignore the political realities of of the West Bank and uh, Israel as a nation state, etc. And then you go to a town like Jerusalem, which, you know, is full of people staring at each other and just kind of thinking, this is ours. At least that was the impression I had. This is ours and not yours. And then there's me bumbling around. And I don't know what role I filled, but um, I think... You know, as one of the producers of this show said, it's something you had to see with your own eyes because you hear a lot about Israel and about Palestine and about who's right and why, you know, justifications for actions and what, you know, why we should do this or why they should do that or why you should listen to me. And uh, it's, it's worth it to see it with your own eyes, regardless of any position you might take on any of the issues. It's a beautiful place. The food is delicious. The people are, for the most part, really friendly. And uh, Jesus Christ, Jerusalem. Oh, uh, should I say Jesus Christ? Okay, one-third Jesus Christ. Jerusalem is a crazy, crazy town. We went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and watched pilgrims from all over the world arriving at the most holy site in all of Christianity. Some of them losing their shit. People just really... Deeply touched, which is, which is interesting for me to see because that's not the world I grew up in. And so the, the visible expression of, of their emotional movement was, was really wild to see. And I, I respected it. I'm not making fun of these people. I respected that level of faith. In the meantime, I was reading a great book and there was a quote in that, which I think kind of sums up the whole thing in a weird way. And I'm paraphrasing that quote, but it was something like, we have just enough religion to hate, but not enough religion to love. All right, on that note, (laughs) that's it for today. 
Thank you guys for listening. I hope the website comes up again soon. Maybe it's a good excuse for you guys to check us out on Twitter. And a special shout out to the Danish Arts Foundation for uh, throwing us a line here. We really appreciate it. Today's show produced by the Undergang Armchair. Intro and outro music provided by MGT Beats. There's a link to MGT Beats on our About and Show Notes page if our website ever works again. <laughs> Interstitial music provided by RC once again. Also linked to that on the Show Notes page. Normally you can check us out at undergang.net. It will be up and running again. But now is a good time to also check us out on Twitter. We are The Undergang on Twitter. We've been showing pictures from Israel. We've been engaging with people. And we'll keep you guys updated about the status of the website on Twitter. Come check it out. Good news is our email's still working. You can email me, ando, A-N-D-O, at undergang.net. Please do. Any thoughts are all welcome. And of course, you can catch us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. There are links to that on our website, and I'll be tweeting them regularly until our website is up again. All right, that about does it. I want to thank, personally, all the listeners, the Danish Arts Foundation. And remember, if you like the show, please tell a friend. Thanks. See you guys next week.